Production and distribution of City Club Forums on IdeaStream is made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Cleveland State University, Robert Conrad, and the Payne Fund. Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Dan Malthrop, Chief Executive here and also a proud member. It's my pleasure to introduce to you our speaker today, the former Defense Minister of Pakistan. He's also the former Governor of the Punjab Province, Shahid Hamid. Even the casual observer of the United States war in Afghanistan would recognize the crucial importance of our nation's relationship with Pakistan. The 69-year-old Muslim nation shares a 1,400-mile border with Afghanistan and is the site not only of the killing of Osama bin Laden, but also more than 400 drone strikes since 2004. With a population of 199 million, or 200 million, who's counting, uh, Pakistan represents extraordinary economic diversity, with modern cities of Lahore and Islamabad and undeveloped tribal regions along the Afghan border. Fans of the Serial podcast and others who followed the story of Sergeant Bo Bergdahl will recall the importance of that region and the difficulty it poses for U.S. forces in Afghanistan. The United States was one of the first countries to establish diplomatic relations with Pakistan after its creation in 1947. Pakistan was a key player that later in arranging then President Nixon's 1972 visit to China, which led to the normalization of ties between the two countries. After the terrorist attacks of 9-11, Pakistan joined the war on terror as a United States ally, arresting hundreds of Al Qaeda members. Because of these efforts, in 2002, President George W. Bush named Pakistan a major non-NATO ally, making it eligible, among other things, to purchase advanced American military technology. That enhanced partnership, the Enhanced Partnership with Pakistan Act of 2009 was known as the Kerry Luger Berman Act, and it further cemented the relationship between the two countries. The bill was signed into law in 2010 and authorized $1.5 billion in annual aid to Pakistan through 2013. Despite the long-standing relationship between the United States and Pakistan, the perspective of citizens of both nations view is tepid at best. In 2014, the Pew Research Center found nearly 38% of the Pakistani population considered the U.S. a threat. The same poll found that only 18% of Americans had a favorable view of their frontline ally. And it's in this context that Mr. Hamid speaks to us today. Mr. Hamid began his career by joining the civil service of Pakistan in 1964. During the next 14 years, he held many posts in the district administration and provincial finance department, later serving as secretary to the chief minister of Punjab and director general of the Lahore Development Authority. In the 1990s, he served as the federal minister for defense, establishment, and law, and as the governor of Punjab province, the most populous of Pakistan's four provinces, containing 56% of the country's population. An attorney, Mr. Hamid has practiced as an advocate of the high court since 1978, and is now a renowned senior advocate of the Supreme Court of Pakistan. Told he's the uh, best lawyer, best attorney in all of Pakistan. <laughs> he is currently also the president of the English-speaking Union Lahore, chairman of the Board of Governors of Rashid Latif Medical College Lahore, and chairman of the Board of Trustees of the Hamza Foundation Academy for Hearing Impaired Children. Mr. Hamid obtained his bachelor's and master's degree in economics from the University of Cambridge, and is a barrister at law of the Honorable Society of the Inner Temple London. Ladies and gentlemen, members and friends of the City Club of Cleveland, Please join me in welcoming Shahid Hamid. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful. It's both an honor and a privilege to be here to be addressing this distinguished gathering on a matter of. Uh, fundamental importance to Pakistan, our relations with the United States. A few days back, I was at a conference addressed by your Council General in Lahore. This is what he had to say. America and Pakistan have entered into a regular, broad-ranging strategic dialogue on a number of issues, including defense, terrorism, economy, power, education, science, and technology. Currently, priority is being given to matters relating to, curb to curbing violent extremists, promotion of peace in Afghanistan, and promotion of trade. Emphasis 
is on more trade, less aid. The bilateral trade between the two countries has risen to $5 billion annually. America is making efforts to promote trade and investment in Pakistan through regular conferences between businessmen of the two countries. America is also undertaking the private investment initiative to help small and medium businesses in Pakistan with special emphasis on economic performance. Since October 2009, America has invested in energy projects and in energy projects which have added 2,300 megawatts to Pakistan's national grid. This has brought electricity to 26 million people. During Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif's visit to America in October 2015, there was agreement between Maryam Nawaz Sharif, the daughter of your Prime Minister, and Michelle Obama for joint launch of a girls' learning program to form part of Pakistan's commitment to raise expenditure on education from 2 to 4 percent of gross domestic product. America has dropped the do more mantra in its dealings with Pakistan and acknowledges the significant help provided by Pakistan in degrading Al-Qaeda and in reducing the level of violence in Afghanistan through Operation zarb e azab conducted by the Pakistan Army in North Waziristan against the Haqqani Network, as also the continuing campaign of the Pakistan Army and security forces against Lashkar-e-Taiba and Jash Muhammad and the Taliban in other parts of the country. America has given $13 billion since 2002 by way of coalition support funds to compensate Pakistan for providing logistic support and military operations against Taliban and Al-Qaeda. America will be providing Pakistan precision weaponry in the form of 12 AH helicopters equipped with Hellfire missiles by 2013. America has no objection to and indeed welcomes the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor investment of $46 billion by China and Pakistan over the next five years. America believes that peace in Afghanistan can be achieved through the quadrilateral group comprising America, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and China. America would like Pakistan to persuade the Afghan Taliban to come to the peace table. As far as America is concerned, it wants the Afghan Taliban to accept the Afghan constitution and the steps taken to secure the rights of women and minorities. American foreign assistance to Pakistan is currently between 800 to 900 million dollars per annum. Economic aid has focused on education, energy, and road projects. America has delinked its relations with India from its relations with Pakistan. Relations between America and Pakistan have steadily improved since 2012. I have uh, outlined for you, as accurately as I can, what the official US view is about Pakistan. But does it tell the whole story? If it does, then why the tensions? Why the editorial in New York Times yesterday? Why the blame games? Or is there another side to the picture? We gained independence in 1947. The first 18 years of our relationship till 1965 were really good. Our prime minister declined an earlier invitation from the Soviet Union to meet with your President Truman instead. America and Pakistan entered into a mutual defense treaty in 1954. We also joined with the US in the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization and the Central Treaty Organization and became in this manner the most allied of allies. Close and continuing links developed between your Pentagon and our general headquarters of the Pakistan Army, which endure to this day. These have seen less bumps than relations between your State Department and our Foreign Office. We had just 14 tanks during our war with India in Kashmir in 1947-48. You gave us an armored division as part of military aid. We provided you with an air base at Badabar near Peshawar for the U-2 overflights over the Soviet Union. The high point in our relations was President Ayub Khan's visit in 1961, during which he was received at the airport by President Kennedy and his wife. Pakistan and Ayub Khan were effusively eulogized and Ayub Khan given a state dinner at Mount Vernon and a ticker tape parade in New York. On a return visit to Pakistan, Mrs. Jacqueline Kennedy was given a welcome that not even superstars command. 
Relations soured a bit when America started arming India in the wake of India's disastrous defeat to China in 1962. However, the real dip in our relations started in 1965, when in the war with India, we found that to the US, mutual defense signed in 1954 meant defense against communist aggression only. The US then proceeded to impose sanctions on arms sales on both India and Pakistan. At that time, we had no worthwhile arms manufacture industries. India not only had a substantial armaments industry, it was also getting all its sophisticated weaponry from the Soviet Union. Thus, it was a severely weakened Pakistan army which faced India in the 1971 war, which led to the creation of Bangladesh. Despite the sanctions, we facilitated Henry Kissinger's historic secret visit to China, which delinked China from the Soviets. We arranged this visit, and Kissinger flew to and from Beijing in our aircraft. The Soviets aided India in 1971 war, which dismembered Pakistan, and its eastern half became Bangladesh. President Nixon intervened at the end by moving the US 7th Fleet to the Indian Ocean, and his warnings to both India and the Soviet Union restrained India from its planned attack on West Pakistan. I digress a bit. At the conclusion of the 1971 war, Indira Gandhi, the Indian Prime Minister, proclaimed, and I quote, we have avenged a thousand years of history. What thousand years? India and Pakistan simultaneously became independent in 1947. It is, however, true that Muslims ruled over increasingly larger parts of India for a thousand years before being supplanted by the British. I mention this so that you understand the deep-seated animosity between some of the people of Pakistan and some of the people of India and how we feel and react when you, in our eyes, strengthen India at the expense of Pakistan. Since 1971, there has been no war between India and Pakistan, but there have been a number of near-war confrontations, troops eyeball to eyeball for months on end on either side of the electrified fence built by India, which runs for nearly 1,800 miles from the Arabian Sea to the high mountains in the north. Don't get me wrong. There are millions on both sides who want peace. They include me, who was governor of Punjab and host to Indian Prime Minister Bajpai in, when he came to Lahore on a bus in February 1999. But regrettably, in relations with India, it is mostly one step forward, two steps back. At the present moment, the relations are becalmed, and there is no meaningful dialogue towards the resumption of the agreed composite dialogue on all issues, including the Kashmir dispute. But, but to return to our relations with the US, matters improved a bit with the advent of Mr. Bhutto's civilian government in late 1971. Sanctions were partially lifted, and arms supplies resumed of non-lethal weaponry. But then came India's first nuclear test in 1974, which they called the Smiling Buddha. Pakistan's response through Prime Minister Bhutto was that we would make the bomb even if we had to eat grass. Kissinger came and threatened that they would make a horrible example of Bhutto if he did not change his mind. US pressure succeeded in getting France to cancel the signed deal to sell us a plutonium reprocessing plant. Why, we asked. The plutonium reprocessing plant was to function under international IAEA safeguards. However, where there is a will, there is a way. We got uranium supplies from a West African country, heavy water from a Scandinavian country, and managing steel for our centrifuges from different sources. And by the early 1980s, we had cold tested the bomb. This under President Ziaul Haq. In the meantime, there had been a sea change at the international level. The Soviets had invaded Afghanistan, and suddenly the US needed Pakistan, and not just Pakistan, also Osama bin Laden of Saudi Arabia, and the Haqqanis, an Afghan tribe, mostly settled in the coast Paktia and Paktika provinces of Afghanistan, even more than we needed America. 
the three $20 million of aid offered by President Carter and rejected by President Ziaul Haq as peanuts was up to $3.2 billion by President Reagan. There was an uncounted and unaccounted flow of money and weapons, including Stinger missiles capable of bringing down Soviet helicopters from CIA and the Pentagon to our inter-services intelligence for distribution to the Afghan Mujahideen. A long, hard fight with the Soviets. The US and Pakistan and the Mujahideen prevailed. The Soviets withdrew. And what happened? Till 1989, the US had protested, but mostly turned a benign eye on the uranium enrichment that was going on at Kahuta. The need for Pakistan's assistance was over. The Senator Pressler Amendment to reimposing sanctions was enforced. These sanctions mostly remained in force throughout the 1990s. During this decade, there was a particularly ugly period in our relations in which we were threatened that we would be declared a terrorist state. The Soviet defeat in Afghanistan was perhaps the very last substantial load, not just a straw on the camel's back that led to the breakup of the Soviet Union. For our part in contributing to this defeat, we paid a heavy price. The country was awash with hundreds of thousands of unregistered weapons and continuing flow of drugs from Afghan poppy fields, which had been encouraged to finance the Afghan Jihad. And worst of all, unemployed, battle-hardened warriors who had been trained by both CIA and RISI for operations against the Soviets. The US walked away, leaving us with the final insult and injury of the Pressler Amendment. In 1998, India conducted five nuclear tests. President Clinton rang Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif not once, not twice, but thrice, not to follow suit. He said he would work with Congress to give us $5 billion in aid, apart from lifting of all sanctions. We seriously considered this offer, but it was not possible to accept. There was a unanimous call from every part of the country to test our bomb. Nawaz Sharif was told he would be exploded if he did not explode the bomb. We tested six bombs, and down came even more American sanctions. Soon after, we came close to another war with India arising from the Kargil incident. President Clinton played an effective role in defusing this crisis, whose aftermath led to Nawaz Sharif being ousted by General Musharraf. Soon, international events changed the entire scenario yet again. The 9-11 attacks took place. Osama bin Laden and, and Al-Qaeda were holed up in Afghanistan, having been given sanctuary by the Taliban government led by Mullah Omar. Osama bin Laden had survived the cruise missile attacks ordered by some years earlier by President Clinton. Just prior to those missile strikes, your CENTCOM commander flew to Rawalpindi to inform that the missiles that our radar would be picking up as they flew over our territory would be US missiles and not Indian missiles. In the wake of 9-11, Pakistan's help was deemed indispensable, and we were therefore brought back from the cold, and amongst other things, we were declared to be a major non-NATO ally of the United States. One of 16 such countries, which includes Israel, Egypt, Australia, New Zealand, Philippines, and Morocco. The US asked for, and we willingly provided logistic support air bases, overflight rights, and overland transport facilities for fuel and weapon movements. In return, we got coalition support funds, lifting of sanctions, and international acceptability of Musharraf's military government. But did we ever become a major non-NATO ally? Forget Israel. We all know that for America, Israel is a very special country. But Egypt, Australia, New Zealand, Philippines, Morocco? Does America treat with Pakistan in the same manner as any of these five major non-NATO US allies? Hardly, not then, not later, not now. The reality is that relations between America and Pakistan have been transactional. Friends, yes, allies, I don't think so. The resumed aid flows benefited Pakistan both economically and militarily. 
but also assisted Musharraf's continuing rule over Pakistan. He remained in office till 2008, wearing as many as four hats, President, Chief Executive, Chief of Army Staff, and Chairman Joint Chiefs of Staff's Committee. U.S. unpopularity amongst large sections of our public is at least partly because of U.S. support for military dictators, lastly General Musharraf, earlier General Ziaul Haq. The last eight years have seen several ups and downs, the continuing roller coaster. On the upside, the U.S. has passed the Kerry Luger Bill, promising economic aid on a sustained basis at the rate of $1.5 billion a year, but this level has never been reached. We have, as your Council General stated, entered into a strategic dialogue on multifarious issues, including defense, counterterrorism, power generation, education, trade and investment, but U.S. private investment in Pakistan remains negligible, and a country like Bangladesh, which is not a major non-NATO ally, has far greater access to U.S. markets than we do. On the negative side, there have been the Raymond Davis and the Osama bin Laden affairs. Raymond Davis was a CIA agent who shot dead two of our citizens in broad daylight. We allowed his exit back to the States after payment of blood money to the heirs of the victims as permitted by our laws. Then came the Salala incident, in which 28 of our troops were killed and 12 seriously injured two miles inside our borders by NATO gunships. For our public, even more than our government, the greatest irritant has been the drone attacks in the federally administered tribal areas, which have caused numerous civilian deaths passed off on the U.S. side as collateral damage, and the constant refrain to do more to restrain the cross-border movement of the Afghan Taliban. Is the do more rhetoric a thing of the past, like your Council General said? Judging by what is happening uh, in your Congress and in the New York Times, I would rather doubt it. On the plus side, American worries about the safety of our nuclear weaponry have reduced quite substantially. We have taken American assistance in devising foolproof systems for securing our weapons, and there is acknowledgement that our weapons are today better secured than those of neighboring India. We have a National Command Authority and a Strategic Plans Division that controls all aspects of the nuclear program and the nuclear weaponry. We have put in place export controls on nuclear materials that are as robust as those of countries forming part of the Nuclear Suppliers Group. We fully coordinate with the UN Security Council 1540 Committee to prevent the proliferation of nuclear, chemical, and biological weapons. So where do we go from here in our two-way relations? First, let me focus on cross-border movements of the Afghan Taliban. Our border with, with Afghanistan is 1,500 miles long. We have offered in the past to build a wall along parts of it, like the 10 feet high wall built along 440 miles of the 600 mile border that we share with Iran, to stop illegal crossings and to interdict the drug trade. This is not acceptable to the Afghans. Why? Because the border is the Durand line, which the Afghan says was imposed on them by the British in 1893, and a wall along this line will mean that they recognize it. This, incidentally, is one of the reasons why Afghanistan was the only country in the world to vote against our admission to the United Nations in 1948. We have 1,000 check posts, one every one and a half miles to check cross-border incursions. The Afghans have 150. We have given shelter to up to 3 million Afghan refugees since the days of the Soviet invasion, nearly one-tenth of Afghanistan's population. President Karzai and his family were amongst them. We have 100,000 troops deployed in Fata and along the Afghan border. What more can we do? At the end of the day, it has to be the Afghan security forces, not even the US and the ISF forces, who must defeat the Afghan Taliban. And if they cannot, and it is a stalemate, then the Afghan government should make peace with the Afghan Taliban. I may add that we are at war with the Pakistan Taliban, and we are not going to make peace with them. We are going to eliminate them. The feared Haqqanis, 
In 1985, President Reagan met with the Afghan Mujahideen leaders, including the Haqqanis, and described them as, I quote, the moral equivalent of America's founding fathers. Your congressman, Charlie Wilson, who played a huge role in the transfer of money and weaponry for the Afghan jihad, said they were, and I quote, goodness personified. The Haqqanis are part of the Afghan Zadran tribe. After the ouster of Mullah Umar's Taliban government, their operational headquarters reportedly moved to Mira Shah in the North Waziristan area of Pakistan under the leadership of Jalaluddin Haqqani and his son Sirajuddin and Badruddin. The militant fighters at their command were variously estimated at between five to 10,000. But according to our intelligence agencies, most of them were resident in areas adjoining Kabul. Mira Shah is 180 miles from Kabul and takes five and a half hours to traverse by road. The attacks by Haqqanis may have been planned in Mira Shah, but were without possibility of any doubt carried out by militants living in or close to Kabul. These attacks are no longer being planned in Mira Shah because Operation zarb ab of the Pakistan Army has forced the Haqqani leadership out of Mira Shah. They are now in Afghanistan, and it is for the Afghan security forces or the US and ISF forces to take them out through drone attacks or otherwise. I may add that the preponderant majority of the North Waziristan residents comprise the Waziri and Diwari tribes. They've had to be moved out of their ancestral homes in order for the Pakistan army to strike at the Akanis and to drive them out, to, out of Mehra Shah and to shut down their training camps. Our continuing participation in the war against terror has cost us dearly. Since 2003, over 7,000 of our security personnel have been killed. We have suffered over 40,000 civilian casualties. Loss to our economy and our infrastructure facilities is estimated at over $5 billion a year. Estimates of loss since 2002 range from 80 to 100 billion US dollars. Our forces have eliminated about 35,000 terrorists, but at a huge cost. Only of a fraction of our losses have been compensated through US assistance. Pakistan has the responsibility as part of the quadrilateral group, the group comprising America, China, Pakistan, and Afghanistan, to persuade the Afghan Taliban to negotiate peace with the Afghan government. We have tried and will continue to do so despite President Ghani's recent statement that he does not need our help anymore. But you can take a horse to water, you cannot force the horse to drink. The peace process has to be an all Afghan affair. The US, China, and Pakistan can only facilitate but cannot make or force peace. In the past, the previous Afghan president, Karzai, had offered to make the senior Haqqani his minister for tribal affairs. Perhaps President Ghani can come up with a better offer. However, let there be no doubt about our intentions, our good faith. We want peace in Afghanistan because the continuing conflict is deeply unsettling with all its consequences in political, economic, and social terms for the Pashtun tribes in Fata who have generations old family and cultural links with the Afghan tribes. About Iran, I always said to American officials when I had some role in this matter that America should settle with Iran. Why, they asked. My reply, because Iran has an elected government. You may not like whom they elect, but their government does represent the Iranian people. Pakistan is happy that a settlement has finally been reached between America and Iran and hopes that it will endure. Incidentally, while the sanctions were on, we did not breach them. Despite sharing a 600 mile long border with them, and despite the fact that we needed the gas for which they had built the pipeline right up to our borders in anticipation of lifting of sanctions. We enjoy good relations with Iran, but have no wish to see a nuclear-armed neighbor on our western border in addition to the nuclear-armed neighbor on our eastern border. About India, you have decided to delink your relations with them from your relations with us, with, with, with us and to make India 
your strategic partner. Good luck. You'll need it. But please remember, <laughs> but please remember one thing. Your strategic partner or not, there is no way we are ever going to accept India's overlordship in the Park India subcontinent or in the Indian Ocean. We are ready and willing to settle all our disputes with them. The dams they are building on rivers Jhelum and Chenab, which will cause shortages of water in downstream Pakistan, Siachen Glacier, Sir Creek, cross-border terrorism, enhancement of trade and travel, and to take all other steps to normalize relations. But there has to be a resolution of the Kashmir dispute in accordance with the wishes of the Kashmiri people. These wishes will be freely expressed only when India withdraws its 600,000 strong occupying army in Indian occupied Kashmir in accordance with UN Security Council resolutions. Do we want war with India? We are not nuts. <laughs> the Indian armed forces are several times the size of our own. India's defense budget is more than $51 billion. Pakistan, $7.6 billion. The strength of India's armed forces is 1,300,000. Another paramilitary, 1,300,000. Pakistan, 600,000. Paramilitary, 300,000. 2.6 million versus 900,000. Can we be a threat to India? No. Can they be a threat to us? Very much so. We would have had problems with India because of the huge inequality between our defense budgets and the numerical strength of our respective armed forces, but for the nuclear equalizer. Drones, your predators. We have the capability to shoot them down. Our air chiefs have said so publicly more than once. We have not and will not. What we have been saying to America for all these long years is that we share the objective of taking out the militants. We know that CIA has ground intelligence without which drone attacks are not possible. But ISI sources are no less and in fact probably much better because after all it is our territory. Transfer the technology to us and we will do the job. The 12 AH Apache helicopters that have been promised along with Hellfire missiles over the next two years may be the start of this process. Incidentally, we have nearly 1,000 aircraft in our Air Force, including about 76 F-16s. Will the sale of another eight F-16s for which funding has been blocked by Congress affect the balance of air power in South Asia, given that the Indian Air Force has over 1,900 aircraft. Our government, like yours, works at many levels. As I said earlier, there is a strong and steadfast relationship between the Pentagon and the GHQ of the Pakistan Army. Many, many of our officers have trained at your defense institutions. One of my sons-in-law, presently a general in the Pakistan Army, trained at the Army War College in Pennsylvania. When Mushar Musharraf took over, the first person he phoned was General Zinni, the CENTCOM commander, to explain and to fix his takeover with your government. Some years earlier, his predecessor had asked President Ligari, under whom I served, why Ligari did not continue with the caretaker setup in which I was defense minister. Ligari's reply, because the Americans would not have supported such a move. Why did he not speak to us, asked the chief of army staff. We would have cleared it for him through our own sources. The point of these anecdotes, relations that may look strained at one level are often much closer and much better at other levels. Counterterrorism. The vast majority of our 200 million people are Sunni Muslims belonging to the Brailvi sect. Brailvis are essentially Sufis in their thinking. They are religious, they have faith in the intercession of what you would call saints, but they are neither militants nor intolerant of others' beliefs. The majority of madrasas, which are religious schools, are Brailvi institutions. Most of the rest are run by the Obandis, who are more Puritan and have affinity with the thinking of the Salafis of Saudi Arabia. But the Obandis are also not terrorists. 
There are approximately one and a half million children studying in about 20,000 madrasas nationwide. Perhaps 40 or 50 of these need a careful watch, which is now being done as part of our national action plan to curb terrorism, which has the unanimous ba backing of all our political parties represented in parliament. The madrasas are being compulsorily registered and the education they impart will be monitored. The Pakistan Army has been deployed in the Operation zarb ab to eliminate all terrorists, whether in Fata or Baluchistan or Karachi or South Punjab. It is not an easy task. The terrorists who number in the thousands, despite depletion of their numbers, live within the towns and cities and have their sympathizers. They are first to be identified. This is the job of our intelligence agencies, the Inter-Services Intelligence, the Intelligence Bureau, Military Intelligence, and the special branches of the provincial police forces. We have over 30 intelligence agencies. Are we succeeding? Yes, we are. And the US administration is conscious of this. Zulfikar Ali Bhutto was perhaps our most popular leader after our founder, Qaeda Azam Muhammad Ali Jinnah. This is what he had to say about the strategy of dealing with America, and I quote, when differences develop, a small country should not take on a great power head on. It is wiser for it to duck, to detour, to sidestep, and try and enter from the bank door. <laughs> we are not the closest of allies, but we are friends. Friends, even allies, do not always agree in all matters. We have our mutual grievances and disagreements, but we shall remain friends. We are mindful of American support for Pakistan, both directly and through the US vote in international financial institutions, such as the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. May Allah, may God bless America and guide her to the right path in her relations with Pakistan. <coughs> and let Pakistan enter through the front door. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You can sit briefly. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we're enjoying a Friday forum featuring Shahid Hamid, the former defense minister of Pakistan and former governor of the Punjab province. We are about to head into the Q&A, and we welcome questions from everyone, City Club members, guests, students, or those of you joining us via our radio, our radio broadcast, our webcast, or our new live simulcast at the Parma Snow Branch of the Cuyahoga County Public Library. I also want to extend a, a special invitation to our, our visiting delegation through the Cleveland Council on World Affairs. If you'd like to tweet a question, please tweet it at the City Club, and our staff will try to work it into the program. Holding our microphone today is the Director of Programming, Stephanie Jansky. May we have our first question, please? Mr. Hamid, uh, a year, a couple years ago, one of our weekly news magazines, either Newsweek or Time, I forgot which one, had a cover story that, that proclaimed Pakistan as the most dangerous country in the world as far from America's point of view. If I heard you correctly in your remarks, you said there's some very good safeguards with all, uh, for any chance of uh, terrorists getting hold or getting access to your uh, atomic weapons, um, nuclear weapons. Uh, is it, say, can you assure us or can we feel safe despite the article uh, that the uh, safeguards are such that uh, m militants or, or terrorists could not get hold of any of those, just one or not one to do, do some horrible damage. And along that line, you say one of the great uh, objections of the Pakistani people is Americans using uh, drones. Are we not taking out with those drones the various terrorists and, and, and terrorist leaders that you have not been able to get or haven't gotten to? Is that not helpful for both of us? Uh, there's a couple of questions you asked there. One about Pakistan being the most dangerous country. Um, there is certainly an impression to that effect amongst uh, large sections uh, of the American uh, people. Um, it's an unfortunate, uh, unfortunate impression because it's not accurate, it's not correct. Um, first, I mentioned the nuclear weaponry. Um, there was perhaps a stage when uh, the weapons uh, were not uh, as closely safeguarded as they are now. Uh, but uh, as I mentioned, and I'm quite frank in saying this because it's not secret, we have uh, cooperated with the Americans 
in devising safeguard systems for the nuclear weaponry. You have, as you know, uh, your own weapons are under uh, a layer of uh, safeguards. Uh, and we have pretty much the same system uh, with the National Command Authority and the Strategic Plans Division. And I think uh, I, I can safely say that uh, at least the fears that were at one time there uh, at um, the uh, concerned levels of your government and in the Pentagon uh, about uh, uh, the danger that our weaponry may fall into the wrong hands, they have uh, largely subsided. They mi might still be there in, in certain circles, but I think they've largely subsided. A and there is no such danger. And <coughs> about that particular danger, let me say, uh, that you know we've uh, we have elections we're supposed to have elections every five years but we've been having them at uh, even more regular intervals and um, the number of votes that all the religious parties together command uh, is less than five percent <coughs> now uh, the five percent of 200 million is uh, is quite a large number yes but uh, 95 percent um, are democratic peace-loving people and uh, there's no way uh, that we are ever going to allow um, uh, that religious fundamental majority to take over our government. And one of the, uh, I think, the biggest safeguards going into the future that uh, Pakistan will not be Talibanized is, is the fact of the increasingly large number of women joining the workforce. And there are professions like the medical profession um, in which women are a majority. Uh, and uh, in, in, the, in the education uh, sector also, uh, especially in private schools. Uh, so uh, when, when that happens, uh, then, you know, uh, the, the, the chances of uh, uh, a radical Taliban government coming are not gone, but certainly uh, they get um, reduced uh, very substantially. I'm sorry in answering this longish, uh, giving you this longish answer, I forgot the drones. precise drones. second question. Drones, drones, drones strikes, yes. Um, 4,000 was the figure mentioned. Um, yes, uh, uh, the, uh, they have taken out militants. Uh, the way they are identified are through mostly joint operations between your intelligence agencies, the CIA on the ground, and our intelligence agencies. Um, uh, live intelligence is fed through satellite to command centers um, in uh, your uh, war headquarters uh, in, in the states, and drone strikes are ordered, in fact, from those centers. Uh, onto where the militants are. We can do the same thing. We have been doing the same thing, amongst other things, through the F-16s. And we will be doing the same thing when we get these Apache uh, helicopters with Hellfire missiles. Um, these are the, uh, you know, we also want to take out the Pakistan Taliban. It's not that uh, we have any love lost at all for the Pakistan Taliban. They have killed 40,000 of our civilians. They have killed 7,000 of our security forces. Why on earth should we uh, be less willing to do it. When you do it, um, there is, of course, one thing is that uh, you are invading, in, an, in a technical sense, you are invading sovereign territory, and then uh, collateral damage is being caused. Um, uh, all right, in a way it helps us because you are causing collateral damage and taking the blame for it, much more blame for it because it is a foreign power in our territory. If we were to do it, we would also have to take the blame for collateral damage because you can't avoid that. Yes, I understand that. But uh, it's better uh, that, you know, uh, and I think maybe that is beginning to happen, some sort of forward movement on that, that uh, it won't happen in the future. I want to thank you for your very illuminating remarks. But I would like to ask you to comment on the past and present relationship between Pakistan and North Korea, both at the government level and non-governmental level. Um, at the, at the, uh, <laughs> you're probably referring to our famous scientist, uh, Dr. Abdul Qadir Khan. Uh, he was a bit of a loose cannon. He probably had too much freedom uh, to go his own way. He was a larger than life figure in our nuclear setup. Um, and he had established contract with the North Koreans, certainly. Um, the uh, contacts were uh, uh, with reference to uh, missile systems. Uh, as you know, uh, there are two ways uh, you have uh, missiles flying. One is through solid fuels and the other is through liquid fuels. Um, he established contact in the 1990s 
and uh, managed to uh, secure for them, from them, uh, liquid fuel technology. Uh, did uh, he or the Pakistan government, uh, in return, give them any nuclear secrets? Uh, the Pakistan government, almost certainly not. Um, did he do it on his own? Uh, all the all the investigations that we held, uh, we did not give uh, your people access to cross cross examining him, but we did cross examine him very thoroughly. Um, and he was under house arrest for quite a while. Um, to the best of our information, he did not give them any nuclear secrets. Uh, they, they, they developed that uh, technology on their own, on their own. <coughs> Thank you for a very, uh, uh, giving the historical perspective of 1,000 years and moving fast forward to 9-11. Uh, it was 2008. It was the time of Obama was, I think, uh, almost entered into the presidency or about to take the presidency, well aware of Pakistani culture, have had a meal of alu kima with Pakistanis, and the first American president who eloquently described the importance of Kashmir. And he said that, you know, if we want to solve the issue of Pakistan and the terrorism, India, and nuclear, the first thing has to be done is the Kashmir issue, an elephant in the room. I have to ask you, what happened? Did the American really try to push India towards a solution? A lot of people think that the I mean, this basically, just the rumors, and we have to basically address that, and the Pakistan military as an establishment basically is not completely at part to solve the Kashmir issue. So that is, uh, I think, is, 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 is the Ashley standard, is the Da Vinci Code of solving so many problems in that issue. Our entire strategic thinking has been India-centric. We have spent billions of dollars to countries who cannot even feed their own people, and would if America and Obama, I believe that you understand, I, I really do think that if he would have done that, did the Pakistani push to ask administration to solve for the last eight years? It's now, he's in the last days of his presidency, and next is uh, Trump, who brings uh, negotiation skills of uh, real estate into the White House. I don't think so it will happen. So that is one. Second is, can you give a scenario, if the Kashmir issue would have been resolved, what will it look like that part of the world? Thank you. Um, about Kashmir, it, it, it hasn't been just President Obama. Uh, just before him, uh, when um, um, Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif, uh, that was during his second tenure, flew across to Washington uh, on the 4th of July uh, and uh, disturbed President Clinton and took him away from the Independence Day celebrations here, uh, part of uh, the uh, understanding or promise that he got from President Clinton was that uh, the Clinton administration uh, would actively assist uh, in uh, getting the Kashmir dispute between Pakistan and India settled. And this has been the position of uh, previous uh, American administrations also. So it's not just President Obama. Uh, it's the previous American administrations also. However, um, the states, um, the government uh, of the United States uh, has said that at best we will jog you together but it is for you uh, to settle it amongst yourselves. Um, and um, then you run into rock hard positions. I, I, I won't say that our position is also not uh, rock hard on this issue, um, uh, but certainly India is. I mean, India starts off by uh, making a statement before each uh, composite dialogue uh, that uh, we are here to discuss the Kashmir uh, dispute, but uh, Kashmir is an integral part of India. Now, when you make that uh, as the opener before even the negotiations start, you're not going to get very far uh, in those negotiations. Um, at one point of time, at actually at two points of time, we came quite close to settling matters with India. One was when Prime Minister Vajpayee came to Lahore in 1999 and signed the Lahore <coughs> Declaration. And I think uh, Vajpayee, who was representing the right-wing parties of India 
uh, was in a very good position to negotiate and settle the Kashmir dispute, and he probably genuinely wanted to. That got derailed by what happened at Kargil a few short months uh, later. And the second time was in the uh, track two diplomacy, the secret diplomacy that was taking place during Musharraf's tenure. Uh, and that has been described by his uh, then foreign minister, Khurshid Kasuri, in that book that he's written, Neither a Hawk Nor a Dove. Um, and the outlines of a settlement was there, but then uh, for various reasons, Musharraf's government weakened and very shortly afterwards, he was out of power and those negotiations led nowhere. At the present moment, there are no signs that we will uh, achieve any, any sort of uh, settlement. Hello, sir. Um, I, my name is Rishim Haseem. I'm actually from Pakistan. I am from Lahore. And I grew up post 9-11. And the thing that I heard the most out of you know, my schools, teachers, even politicians, was that it was not, it's not our war. Uh, it was someone else's fault, and it happened, and now we have to deal with it. It's like a very normal narrative that they're good Taliban and bad Taliban. It's not our war. But the extremism is not just extremist militants. It's also an extreme in mindset. And don't you think in our curriculum, in our state policy, we do kind of, you know, encourage that, we promote that extremist mindset. And like you mentioned, the Bravelys and how they are a very peaceful sect in Islam. But these same Bravely people are the one who uphold the crazy blasphemy law, a law that I'm not even allowed to talk about in Pakistan. And these same people burn down Joseph Colony with the Christian community. So don't you think, like, how much responsibility as Pakistanis should we, do we need to take? How much is, I mean, I, yes, I understand there are a lot more factors involved in what has happened, but as people of Pakistan, how much responsibility should we put on ourselves that, yes, extremism has happened because of certain things that we have done wrong in our country? Well, you're, you're, you're right. I mean, I can't uh, agree with you more and with the thrust of your questioning. Uh, I did mention uh, what, uh, uh, what a small percentage of people were uh, belonged even to religious parties, and not all those religious parties are fundamentalist by no means. I mean, some of them are, are religious, yes, but uh, uh, you could say that, you know, they are as religious uh, uh, inclined as perhaps the evangelicals are in, 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 in the United States, uh, and uh, others uh, uh, perhaps in, in Europe, uh, in the French, uh, Le Pen and uh, her people. Um, however, uh, even 1% of 200 million is a very large number, is a very large <laughs> number. So, uh, and if, if, and, and if you're if you militant uh, and you have that inclination and you have that sort of motivation, you can cause a huge amount of disruption. I mentioned that we have taken out 35,000 terrorists, that's absolutely right, but there are very large numbers that uh, still remain. Um, it requires a change in, in, in the mindset of people. Uh, and uh, the mindset of the people, uh, it's partly a question of the educational system and partly a question of uh, making absolutely sure and making it clear to the terrorists that there is no way you're going to be allowed to prevail. Um, for that, I think the latter, we have developed that national will. It was important to have that national action plan in place, uh, which was subscribed to by every one of the political parties represented in parliament. And as a result, we passed, frankly, pretty draconian laws. As an as, as a, as a advocate, a senior advocate of the Supreme Court, I can't really support such laws. But they're probably as necessary as the, uh, what is it, the Patriot Act, sir? In, in, in the United States, you have had to forego certain um, fundamental rights, certain civic liberties, in order to take this, uh, take on this threat, and uh, have military courts. I mean, we have military courts now functioning within Pakistan. They have military courts functioning in, uh, in Guantanamo. They haven't brought them onto the onto the continental United States. Uh, it's not an easy battle. It's going to take time, but it's people like you uh, who are going to have to continue the fight in the years to come. Hello. 
Um, during the Bangladesh Liberation War, the American consul in Dhaka sent a telegraph to Kissinger essentially saying, let's not turn a blind eye to what's happening in East Pakistan. And Kissinger opted instead to, to side with, with Pakistan in hopes of seeing an opening to China. Um, and so the, what was dubbed as the blood telegram then, um, what are, does that still bear implications on the U.S.-Pakistan relationship? And if so, what are they? Uh, are you asking me about the relationship with China? Well, the uh, U.S.'s choice to to side with Pakistan in that war in 1971, does that still bear implication on the relationship between the U.S. and Pakistan to di this day? In the, in, in the 1971 war, um, uh, we were a deeply divided country. Uh, there's no two ways about it. Um, uh, there was always a, a bit of an inequality between West and East Pakistan. One, we were separated by a, a thousand miles of India in between. Um, secondly, a, a, a different uh, ethnic and linguistic uh, uh, problems also. They uh, having Bengali as the national language, we having Urdu as the national language. Then uh, West Pakistan being territory-wise much larger, and at that time, uh, a much richer part of Pakistan than, than East Pakistan, and they feeling exploited that we take away their resources and don't give uh, enough in return. So there was perhaps an inevitability of the division, uh, but that uh, division uh, could have taken place peacefully. It did not uh, because of uh, Indian military intervention supported by the Soviet Union. Um, we expected at the time much more U.S. support than we actually got. Um, uh, China uh, did help out to an extent um, in military terms, uh, in, 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 in as much as it moved some of its forces onto the uh, Indian border, which kept uh, their uh, forces uh, facing China locked in. I mean, they didn't also move against uh, Pakistan. Um, and at the end of the day, um, President Nixon in particular, uh, we are grateful for uh, his support because, uh, as I said, he moved the uh, Seventh Fleet from the Pacific into the Indian Ocean. And he gave more or less um, public warnings, both to the Soviets uh, and to uh, India, to lay off West Pakistan. And uh, uh, that didn't help. Um, uh, didn't help us avoid defeat, no, we were defeated in that war, but at least it kept the present territory of uh, Pakistan intact. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we've been enjoying a Friday forum featuring Shahid Hamid, former Defense Minister of Pakistan and former Governor of the Punjab Province. Today's forum is the Ibn Sina Society Forum at the City Club of Cleveland, made possible by the generosity of Ibn, Society, Ibn Sina Society members, led by Dr. Zia Khan. We thank you very much, sir, for your support. Our community partners for today's forum were the Cleveland Council on World Affairs and the Northeast Ohio Consortium for Middle East Studies. We also welcome guests at, at a table hosted by the Pakistan American League. We thank you all very much for your support. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being here today. Thank you for your questions. Mr. Hamid, thank you very much. Our forum is now adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org. Production and distribution of City Club Forums on IdeaStream is made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Cleveland State University. Robert Conrad, and the Payne Fund.